they consider that we are consuming a credit card size worth of microplastic every single week. That's five to eight grams of microplastics every single week. So if you think of that laid up on top of each other, it's kind of crazy. It's disgusting as well. <laughs> I've interviewed a bunch of legends about the environmental impacts of plastics and my guests kept saying the word microplastics. I was confused. What are microplastics and why are we consuming so much? So I've gone straight to the top boss, Dr. Michelle Blewett, the program director of Ozmat, an Australian crew trying to tackle the microplastics problem Head on. Act like Microplastics. Well, the problem with microplastic is it's just big bits of plastic predominantly they break up into smaller pieces. It never breaks down, never ever goes away, okay? And so once they become smaller and smaller until they're less than five millimeters in size, and then they become what we call microplastics. So when plastic gets made in its base form, it gets made into these round pellets that then get colored and molded and um, into the products that we use every day. And that's the thing with plastic is that it was made to be durable. It was made to last forever. And that's exactly what it does. How is it winding up on our beach? Many coastal beaches across the country are relatively clean of yeah. microplastics okay. and I say that in inverted commas. Yeah. Most of what we find on our shorelines comes from us from land, from urbanisation. So it comes down our stormwater network, yeah. okay, and either lands on our beaches or where we are here at, on our lake systems. Where we are today is a constructed lake system, so it's man-made, human-made I like to say because it could have been a woman for as far as I know. It captures all that stormwater runoff from the streets all around. The ocean's downhill from everywhere. Most stormwater outlets don't have catchment baskets yep. or what we call gross pollutant traps. Most of them only capture the big stuff, yep. like the bottles, the straws, the cups, right? But it doesn't capture the small stuff. This near invisible problem that we want to make people aware of, and that's why we run our program. Why does it suck to us? Why does it suck to flora fauna? It's synthetic. It shouldn't be here. The colour of them looks very much like a fish egg. And so if you get the likes of seagulls or other bird species are consuming this. Yeah. Now we don't eat seagulls. No. Well, not last time I checked. No, there was one guy that tried to eat an ibis though. We've got an ibis on ice ready to dissect just oh, that. Right. <laughs> so I can fill you in on that way. Not to ah, You thought I was going to go uh, really badly take this conversation the wrong way. Ibis on ice, there you go. Really bad uh, performance, you know what I mean? Ibis on ice. So this lake system where we are, even though it's man-made or human-made, there's a lot of fish in here that people come down and fish. Mm -hmm. They eat those fish. And so you get the fish that are possibly, most probably, consuming the plastics as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we eat the fish. What's more also is that plastics, when they're in the aquatic environment, which is also filled with lots of other toxins, yeah. like runoff from fertilizers, dog poop that's been left in the system, you name it, these plastics act like magnets or sponges and then they soak up all those other chemicals that are in our environment. And so not only is whatever's consuming this gets a dose of the plastics itself, which is made of plasticides and chemicals, it's synthetic, it also gets a dose of whatever it's soaked up as well. Yuck. It's been known to be found in water, of salt, lots of food products, cosmetics, been found in beer. But to date, thank goodness, they haven't found it in wine. We're in South Australia, we're all healthy, baby. What happens then? Do we poop it out or does it just stay in there or what? A bit of both. It's been known to cross the placental barrier. So, which means there's the babies, the amniotic fluid within the baby, uh, surrounding the babies, really? has been found with having plastic. It's been found in the deepest part of our lungs in operations. It's been found in poop. We can't feed plastic to people. So we can't have controlled, situ can't ex have controlled experiments. Yeah, yeah. Because there's never, there's no one oh on this planet that hasn't been impacted by plastic in one way or another. It's heavy, it's a he yeah. And it is, it's called eco-grief. Yeah. Like, and we face it in this industry all the time, which really sucks. I don't know about you, but all that info leaves me feeling pretty pissed off and a little grotty. I still can't get over the fact that we consume a credit card's worth of microplastics every single week. So, what is Dr. Michelle and her crew at OzMap trying to do to help alleviate the problem? Well, OzMap is the Australian Microplastic Assessment Project, uh, and it's a project of that which was designed initially as a sort of more campaigning about microplastic. But as a scientist, I wanted to then bring into effect like, well, we need to assess where it is and monitor where it is. Uh, but then once we found out, okay, we've got these hotspots coming up, 
where is it coming from and how do we stop it? And that's become our mission over the last five years. There's a nationwide citizen science program. We follow a very strict methodology and we run one day full training and accreditation in the program so that we know that the people we're teaching knows our methodology. We keep that very strict in that we only want people that are trained to be able to run our program so that we know that the data that we get back is rigorous and comparable between sites. So we can compare this site to any other site that we've collected across the country. That's the kind of sampling that we would collect mm -hmm. uh, and we would track that. We'd collect at least three to five in any location of quadrats and that gets added onto our database, onto our hotspot map. Yep. We want people to collect in the same location so we can look at how, change, how it changes over time. Be a scientific methodology, we're not just about picking it up, we're about quantifying it. So we can come down to this beach and not necessarily pick it all up. What we do with that data though then is to be able to use that information and that, and that data to be able to implement where it's coming from and how to make changes. So Nurdles, for example, that's an industry issue. And so these things being so small, they, they are spilled through that transportation or the manufacturing. So we've been able to track back to one of those sources. He was completely unaware of the issue. Um, they would literally blow the debris in the street down the stormwater drain when we first started this. That's why the levels were so high. Yeah. Purely because out of sight, out of mind, which yeah. is what happens with so many things that to do with litter and rubbish around the world. We've now got drain traps in the street. They've now got street sweepers as opposed to blowers. What our aim is, is to educate people, engage people, and then empower people to make that change. And if there are areas such as this that people have in their local areas that are hot spots, let us know. We want to figure out where it's coming from. Actually, I had an email just yesterday from another council area in Sydney that have found an issue and they want us to look into it. Because it's not only these kind of plastics that we're finding now, there's also rubber crumb and synthetic grass, which is the next environmental nightmare that we're facing. This is what we refer to as rubber crumb. You can see the green and the black. Now this is made of recycled tyres, not tyres that we've had recycled from Australia, tyres that have been imported. And they create these softball playgrounds and you can see underneath this swing here, it's all been rubbed off. We've done some leachate studies, which means basically putting this stuff in water and we have to dilute it down 99% before it stops killing aquatic organisms. So we've been looking at this um, running into the Great Barrier Reef. There's some playgrounds out there that have actually signs on them that say do not play on these fields, or on these playgrounds when it's over 30 degrees because of the heat that comes off these synthetic turf. Now this does have a bunting, the cement around it, so that can help minimise the loss. Up in Queensland we found some sites that are losing 4 million pieces of this within four metres of these playgrounds. And so we've put in, in certainly in New South Wales, a monitorium to ban the installation of um, softball playgrounds and synthetic fields for the next five years until we can figure out where, what we can do about it. Honestly, it was kind of shitty talking to Michelle because now I'm so aware of how prevalent microplastics are in our day to day. And her avalanche of just pointing it out just kept coming. After showing us the rubber crumb, she took us along the lake and pointed out significant amounts of foam that had been washed up onto shore, most probably from degrading pontoons in front of lake houses. That's what I'm talking about. That's a habitat. See the big fish that are down? That's a habitat for these fish. They're probably feeding on the algae that attach to the bottom of that pontoon but yet that pontoon is probably filled with with polystyrene and so they're probably having a munch of polystyrene a munch of of algae to wrap up this eye-opening episode of act local i'll leave you with some suggestions that michelle has for councils put some traps on these stormwater outlets that can capture the small stuff before it's released into yeah. the environment if nothing else you know that's the first point of call the first short-term mitigation should be to put traps in these areas to be able to capture it and for you to help lower the presence of microplastics. You know, there's so many little things that you could try and get rid of um, as a general consumer. Just making people aware that if in the supermarkets, if people continue to buy the tri-coloured capsicums in the plastic bag, because they want one of each, they're going to continue putting them on the shelves. It's changing the consumer's decisions so that it changes the mentality of our supermarkets and that as well. Supply and demand. Supply and demand. If you know another local legend doing cool shit to protect the natural world, comment their name down below and I'll go have a chat with them. Cheers, bye.